I always think that the best way to know God is to love many things. I am fond of that quotation. It speaks to the willingness to find the divine in many things, in the diversity of human life, in the exuberance of nature, in the variety of art, in the differences of flowers. I thought about that quotation as I was preparing for the flower communion this week. And I thought of it as I was walking the long, cool, quiet halls of the Art Institute last week. I went to see the Van Gogh exhibit. And I thought about that quotation there because Van Gogh is its author. And he is indeed someone whose love for the many things in life translated into a beauty that verges on the sublime, on the divine. I've always loved his art for this reason. And part of what makes his art so divine is its contrasts, at least the contrasts that I perceive in it. Now, I wonder if this is in part based on my own knowledge about his life and death that makes me see this in his paintings, that makes me read it into his paintings. I do wonder if it's partly my own subjective interpretation, but I have always perceived a penetrating sadness beneath the beauty. The gorgeous fields of France look just a little too sunburned and lonely. The people often appear isolated with shoulders slumped and heads hung. The brows in the self-portrait look stitched with worry and ache. It seems to me that sadness and beauty arm wrestle in his paintings. At one moment, it seems as though beauty, the beauty of the sprawling stars will get the upper hand triumphing over the implicit loneliness of the night. At another moment, the penetrating sadness of the solitary peasant wins and the beauty recedes. Van Gogh no doubt saw this in his own work. As he once put it, art is made to console those who have been broken by life. The thing is, I am not sure that I would love his paintings as much if they did not communicate that sadness. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that I would have wanted sadness for Van Gogh. I don't want that for anyone. But there is something compelling and powerful about art that holds that tension. Such pieces admit more readily to the realities of life in which triumph and tragedy, hope and despair, beauty and sadness converge, dance and struggle with one another. As Rumi put it so well in the quotation that Nancy read this morning, God placed a pearl in sorrows hand. Many philosophers admit that art is rarely beautiful unless there is some complexity or contradiction in it. It loses its aesthetic integrity when it is only bright and pretty. Now this does not mean that bright and pretty works don't have their own allure, I admit that they do, but they rarely have longevity. They are often forgotten. It is the work of art that communicates the complexities and the contrasts of life that have staying power. Today, we celebrate the flower communion. We bring and exchange flowers with one another as a recognition of the beauty of the human spirit. And it is a lovely ceremony and in its loveliness lies something of a problem. I think there is a temptation with this ceremony to perceive it only as bright and pretty, perhaps even a bit trite. Let's get together and exchange some flowers. If it were only that, if it were only pretty, my hunch is that it would not have stayed around for so long. 
it would lack staying power. Instead, today, we celebrate its centennial. 100 years, Unitarian congregations around the world have celebrated the flower ceremony. And Unitarian Universalist congregations across the United States and across the world today are with us celebrating the flower communion. And that should give us some clue that there is more depth here, a deeper angle into the complexities and contradictions of life. It's not just pretty. Indeed, there is both beauty and tragedy in its story. One need look no further than the biography of Norbert Kepik, the author of The Flower Communion. After he created the ritual, he was murdered for his liberal religious convictions in a Nazi concentration camp. He spoke out from the pulpit against Nazi atrocities in full knowledge that he may pay the ultimate price for doing so, and he did so anyway. And with that part of the story now in place, it is like the camera angle opens out and beside the ritual's bright flowers, we see also the heartbreak that saturates the image. It is there that we brush against the depth of the ceremony. We exchange flowers, not in a world that affirms beauty, but in one that ruins it and that ruins nature. We celebrate diversity, not in a world that affirms it, but in a context that passes laws to ban it. We honor the human spirit, not in an innocent world, but against the backdrop of the tragic. Religion is truest when it attends to both realities, neither minimizing the pain nor ignoring the joy. Instead, its beating heart needs to hold forth the contrasts of the human condition, and in doing so, it makes room for our own heartbreak and loss, our own struggles against injustice and inequity, as well as our joy and our hope. Yes. It is true, it is, uh, it is true that Norbert Capek, he was unlikely to have intended the flower communion to have these complicated undertones. His was a bright faith. His was an optimistic faith formed before the onset of the two world wars. One commentator described his faith as sun-drenched. And with that optimism, it's easy to imagine that his intentions for the flower communion were a bit more, let's say, bright-sided. He could not have predicted the later nuance that would come with it. He could not have known exactly where his ministry would take him, how his life would finally end for it. But it is nonetheless the totality, both Kepik's intentions for the ceremony as well as the fuller version of his life that gives us the meaning of the ceremony today as we celebrate it. Kepik discovered Unitarianism while he was traveling in the United States. At that time, he was working as a journalist and he was so captivated by the message of the Unitarian faith that he chose to pursue the ministry. As Kepik put it, liberal religion spoke of the goodness of the human spirit, and I believed it. And I believed it. Once he received clearance, he returned to his home country. And there he founded the Unitarian Universalist congregation in Prague called the Liberal Religious Fellowship. Thousands flocked to his new church. His religious sentiments were hopeful, inspiring, and reasonable. It was just the type of religion that so many were yearning for at that particular moment. At its height, the membership of his congregation swelled to 3,200 people. 
3,200 people in his congregation alone. But his leadership would not last long. During the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia, the Gestapo broke into his apartment. They confiscated his books and sermons and arrested him and his youngest daughter. He was charged with treason. He had preached publicly against the Nazi regime. His Unitarian faith compelled him to speak out despite the risk, and so the Gestapo decided that they would transport him to Dachau. There he was subjected to hard physical labor, tortured, and eventually executed. When news of his death reached the US, the American Unitarian Association President Frederick May Elliott wrote, another name is now added to the list of heroic Unitarian martyrs by whose death our freedom has been bought. Martyr. Martyr is a strong word, a severe word, and it contains exactly the thread that I am lifting up in the sermon today. It contains within it the gravity and the heartbreak that can overtake a life. It contains within it the permeating sadness that knows that this world has injustice and pain in it. And at the same time, it gestures towards the triumph of a human spirit, a spirit that refuses to accede to cruelty and despotism. There is something undeniably powerful, undeniably beautiful about a life that confronts the worst and yet still celebrates the best. Such was the life of Norbert Kepik. The poet Stephen Spender said it so well, to think continually of those who are truly great, who from the womb remembered the soul's history through the corridors of light where the hours are suns endless and singing, who never allowed gradually the traffic of the world to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. With may each of these flowers that we have exchanged today, that we have handed to one another, may each of these flowers today sing to us of this power, sing to us of loving the many things in this world, even when it's easier to forget that they exist, sing to us of a human spirit that buds forth amidst the noise and the fog and the hardship, sing to us of the splendor amidst the difficulty and the pain, the sadness and all also the truth that the beauty of the human spirit can yet spill forth in triumph in all of its audacity and courage. That the human spirit can yet prevail. And then let us say, along with Norbert Kepik, yes, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs>